and then I'll have a little bit of recap and uh, dive right in. All right. Uh, again, welcome to the August uh, Springfield AWS meeting. We're going to talk about ECS today. Um, first off, I'm going to um, I typically go through this type of outline where I introduce the service and talk about terminology, um, hit some pricing and metrics, and then a demonstration. Um, but we're going to dig right into the demo today because this is going to be pretty uh, demo heavy. How many people are familiar with containers? The, the concept of containers? Okay, most of you. Okay, that, that's very help helpful. Um, ECS or Elastic Container Service allows you to host Docker containers in the cloud. Uh, you can either host them on EC2 instances, that's their, their traditional virtual server, or you can host them in Fargate managed containers uh, which is a, a little bit of a new concept. Um, without going into a ton of detail, the gist of it is it's a little bit more complicated to set up containers on EC2 versus Fargate. Fargate's designed to be a, a really easy solution where you say, I need to run this many containers and they just take care of the container orchestration. Whereas with um, hosting on EC2, you can save on costs by um, uh, grabbing some reserved instances if you have a, a pretty large load and a lot of EC2 instances uh, to keep costs down. Uh, and, and you can also um, specify smaller containers. Uh, Fargate has minimums that um, are above what we need for our own company. So we don't use Fargate as much as other people do. Um, for example, their minimum memory allocation is 256 meg, where a lot of the tiny worker threads that we have just barely too big for serverless, um, maybe could be re-engineered for serverless, Lambda functions and such, but um, are so small that we're able to assign them 128 meg and they're super happy. Um, also, when you slice up CPU, you can slice up uh, Fargate CPU to um, a, a quarter of a uh, quarter of a CPU and you can slice up your own EC2 instances as much as you'd like. Um, you can learn more about that by Googling for AWS ECS pricing. And I'll point out the areas that I'm talking about right now just so that you know where to look. Uh, in, in particular, th this is talking about that's ECS pricing. Uh, that was EC2 pricing, sorry. Um, when you hit the pricing page, it asks you if you want the Fargate pricing or the EC2 pricing. And I will drop into the Fargate pricing just so you can see what I'm referring to here. Um, they, they price um, by quarter CPU, half CPU, full CPU, multiple CPU. Um, they also price um, per gigabyte. So you can, you can calculate what that might look like based on those figures. Um, but the gist of it is if you have a lot of tiny uh, containers, you would come out ahead on EC2. Um, with that, let me jump right into the demo because we're going to build some things out with uh, cloud formation and being brave and doing that during a live demo. Probably not the best plan in the world, but I'm doing it. Um, so logged into uh, an empty an empty AWS console. Can everyone see that all right? I'm going to expand it a little bit for your benefit. <clears throat> and just to give you an idea, um, we'll hop into EC2 and look. We don't have any EC2 instances active except this. Um, the important piece is um, specifically ECS instances. Um, we, you can see some that I terminated from uh, testing earlier. If you go into ECS, uh, you'll find that you get the, the greeting screen. And if you click on clusters, there are no clusters. I'm going to kill out some of these task definitions <clears throat> so that things don't choke on us. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they don't have a bolt um, delete. Uh, while I'm deleting these, I'll, I'll describe a little bit of what we're seeing here. So if you're familiar with Docker, you typically create a Docker image and you upload it to the, the Docker repository. 
Amazon has the ECR, or Elastic Container Regis Registry, that provides the same service in a private setting. So um, you can keep everything in the same AWS cloud account. You don't have to rely on a third party. Um, then these task definitions uh, are essentially uh, the AWS equivalent of your um, Docker Compose. Uh, these are telling AWS um, what, which images need to run as which services, and <clears throat> as you can see, a lot of testing happened. I thought all of this got deleted out, my apologies. But um, this is, like I said, th these are essentially your, your Docker Compose and, and defining um, how, how you would run those Docker images. And then finally, um, you have the, the cluster itself. And that is where we're going to define, um, okay, all clean here. That's where we're going to define the servers that are going to run the Docker services. All right, so um, I'm heading into cloud formation. I don't have any active stacks on this account. We're going to start by creating a, some, a few stacks. I'm gonna create them and then while they're running, I'm going to um, go back and look at each of them with you. But the gist of it is um, I have four different stacks. Uh, I split this up so that we could discuss it in pieces. Uh, but all of this will be available out on the SGF AWS GitHub afterwards. Um, first, we're gonna start with a, um, a MySQL instance. Um, and I've got it set up to where it'll ask you uh, for some info to customize it. We're going to go with some basics. Obviously not going to keep this around for very long, so we'll stick with the basic password. Um, I encourage you to uh, um, tag all of your stuff as you build it. Um, at a minimum, I like to track stacks so that if we're looking at billing, I can see, oh, we still have stuff hanging out there that's not production or test. What's going on with that? Um, so I'm going to fly through here real quick and create the rest of these stacks. Um, the next stack is going to create that um, Docker registry and the tasks. And we're going to dig in and look at those, but it's not time efficient uh, for us to sit here and walk through creating every single thing or we'd be here for three hours. This, I'm trying to cover like a two weeks worth of work in 60 minutes. So um, I do plan to field questions afterwards. Um, and this stack name isn't super relevant. Um, I, I make sure that it matches the file that I'm um, uploading so that I know sort of where the, the stack came from. <clears throat> All right. And this is asking me to confirm uh, that it's creating a IAM resources in the AWS account. And IAM resources are essentially permissions. Uh, if you already have resources defined with the same names, it can clobber some things up. So it is asking you to acknowledge that and make sure that your templates don't have um, uh, duplicate names. Next, we're going to create the, the actual ECS cluster. Um, and all these things take five to 10 minutes to create. So we're gonna have plenty of time to walk through here. Um, but the reason I'm walking through this with you is I want you to see we started from scratch and by the end, we're gonna have a working Laravel installation on ECS. So I felt like it was important to walk through this. Um, it, it's asking a couple questions. In this case, this cluster is what um, creates your your EC2 instances, and in, and I'm telling it to create two instances of type T2 small. Um, that's probably about the minimum you could get away with for a demo. Um, and then because I'm creating EC2 instances or, or essentially Linux virtual machines, I am telling it which SSH key to use in case I need to access the machine and troubleshoot. And now, if you're not familiar with the networking side of, of AWS, you end up with um, 
you end up choosing a region. In our case, we're working with US East Wine, that's the original data center in Virginia. And then, um, and then you choose the subnet. So the VPC is tied to the, the entire region. That's essentially your virtual network for the whole region. And then these subnets are three of the data centers in that region. And I'm telling it um, to, to restrict um, activity to those three subnets. You usually want to focus your activity in a, in a somewhat narrow scope so that you can ensure that your your front end servers that we're getting ready to spin up are in the same in the same data centers as the back end servers. You wouldn't want your database to be even five or ten miles away. It makes sense for it to be in the same building if possible. All right. So let's fire this up. And then finally, we're going to create an application load balancer. Um, and that's the web, the public facing component of this whole mess that makes it uh, available to anyone on the internet. Um, everything else that we're setting up is locked down to where you couldn't access it directly from the internet. You'd have to be inside the network. And when we were, um, it's giving me the same drop downs here. Let me, when we were looking at the list of EC2 instances, I. You might have noticed that I had a spare instance there. Um, that's floating out there for the sole purpose of SSHing into that instance so that we can hop into the um, essentially the ECS Docker servers if we needed to troubleshoot something. Stack. Hello. All right. Create. All right. So as you can see, some of these things are still being worked on while we're. Um, Waiting on that, I'm going to back up just a little bit and um, talk about each of these. Um, you'll see each of these files right here. Hopefully, everybody can see this all right. Let me try to zoom in. Um, well, I'll make sure you can read the text. So, this is the project that you'll end up seeing out on GitHub. Um, I'm going to back way up all the way to the beginning and um, pull up some notes here. Um, all right, does anybody happen to know how to zoom in JetBrains software? Anybody? Command plus is not working. I, I, wait, that was my go-to. Can you read it okay? All right, well, we'll roll with this then. Um, uh, this isn't as important. Uh, I'll, I'll have these notes out here, but this is sort of the step-by-step -step of how this comes together. So start to finish, we're talking about setting up Laravel in a Docker container. And so um, from the very get-go, we wanted to create the MySQL uh, server and um, Rather than sh give you a step-by-step -step there, uh, I, I have you run the cloud formation tool. But let's look at that um, just so you have an idea of what it looks like. This is telling us um, th the beef of this is under resources. Everything above that is um, essentially um, the options that you saw when we were creating the cloud formation template. Um, it's All it's doing is saying, I want to start um, an instance with this name and SSD storage uh, and 20 gig of storage because it's carrying that from up above. Um, instance class T2 small. I'm going to run MySQL 5.7 and I'm going to use this username and password. I mean, that's it's the cloud formation templates are, are pretty simple. The main reason they look complex is because they have these extra um, uh, parameters at the top that allow the users to customize things. So. So we've created that MySQL server. Um, <clears throat> we need to modify the security group to allow MySQL from anywhere for this demo. You wouldn't normally do that, but we're going to do that for the sake of time. So let's uh, go to EC2. And we'll find the security group that it created for <clears throat> For my sequel, mm -hmm. 
Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. It looks like we're already set. We're going to go to uh, RDS, where it's creating that MySQL server, and just check on it and see how it's looking. Um, it's So it's created, and now it's uh, performing the initial backup. Um, so we're going to do a couple of things here. I'm going to check to see <clears throat> what the endpoint name is because we're going to need to put that in our configuration file. And that may be the same endpoint name that we already had. Yeah, it's somehow managing to generate the same name every time. And then we're checking to make sure that our inbound security group is really allowing MySQL from anywhere. And apparently I've addressed that in the template, so we're good there. Um, and then next we create a Laravel project. Um, for the sake of time, I've already done a few of these steps, but um, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so we're going to go back and forth here. I've, I've essentially run a uh, installed the Laravel composer or the Laravel installer locally. Um, it kicked back with a couple of errors, so I ran these commands to fix them. Um, and then I configured uh, the database settings, uh, which we read all of these from um, the information we plugged into the CloudFormation template and then that host name or endpoint from AWS. Um, and then we configure user authentication. Um, I'm going to spare you the details on some of this Laravel stuff if you're not here for Laravel. Um, but then uh, essentially, when everything's said and done, we're able to run a command locally to, to spin up a server that allows us to browse to Laravel on the local machine. And so that's where we're at right now. <clears throat> Next, we configure some Laravel health checks. Um, I will t touch on that just a little bit because this is important for um, ECS. It's very helpful to have good health checks when your application is running in ECS because um, Amazon is able to monitor all of your Docker containers, and by default, it will um, uh, by by default it will just hit the main uh, page of the the website and assume that a 200 reply is good. But we've gone a little bit above and beyond here. We've installed a uh, some code called health checks by PHP Safari. And then when we went to configure it, we commented out a few of the, the default settings. Um, but now if we go to run uh, health checks, uh, it's checking database and such, and it is telling us that the, the database is not current, so, which makes sense because we just spun it up. So we're gonna go ahead and um, update our database, run our health checks again. Now we're, we're getting all green. Um, more importantly, we can, um, oh uh, yeah, all right, uh, serve has to be running to check it. We can run a, a check against slash underscore health, and you'll see that we got a 200 response and we have some metadata that we can parse if we want to do something fancy. Um, so that's the benefit of having that health check. And it has more flexibility than that, but we're gonna go with that by default. Now the next piece that we, we need to do when we're running do uh, Laravel in a Docker container is build out a Docker file. The Docker file defines the local image. And um, in our case, the Docker file we're using to host Laravel uh, starts with a PHP 7.1 and Apache file, and then it goes on to install uh, numerous requirements, configures Apache, um, configures in Composer, and installs uh, Laravel and all the related packages, and then we get into some nitty gritty that is really um, outside the scope of the normal Laravel install. Uh, at this point, we're basically using a couple of different tricks to um, build one container that can do different jobs. So in this case, um, this one Docker image can act as a web server. 
and it can act as a um, job consumer or a worker, and it can act as essentially a, a cron daemon. It's a network-based crime that's built into it. Um, it's Redis-backed. It allows you to schedule jobs and run multiple cron servers, and even if one were to go down, um, uh, your job's always gonna hit. And if two try to run the job, it, it's aware and it knows not to run it twice. But for that to work, um, by default, we have the server come up as a web server. But we add to these other files, like the supervisor D and the entry point files, that allow us to start up the server in a couple of different modes. And you'll see a little bit more of that in a second. Um, and then finally, uh, we copy all of the files for, for Laravel to bar WW, and then, and then we copy all of the files from, from the public facing folder to slash public. So you really end up with two copies in the image, could clean that up if you wanted to. Um, but when we're using, when we're using containers, uh, we treat all of them as a uh, short lifespan or, or uh, temporary. Uh, we could lose a container at any time and AWS just spins up new containers. So we're not relying on any of these containers to store database things. That's why we started up the database in RDS. We're not relying on any of the containers to store user content. That's why um, we are, our Laravel setup is S3 backed. Um, the containers don't even store user session information. All of that is Redis backed. So by doing that, we can literally spin up uh, dozens of workers or dozens of front end um, containers just as demand requires and, um, and then destroy them as load drops. Uh, finally, uh, a couple more things uh, to prep Laravel for, for usage. And then when everything's said and done, we, um, we can run uh, Docker up and it will, uh, I need to run Docker. Um, when we run Docker up, it will build the local image and it will host it locally. And, and that allows us to test it locally. If you can't get your application to run in Docker locally, I can guarantee you it's not going to run in ECS. So very worth troubleshooting things. Like in this case, um, we're just waiting for Docker to come up. <clears throat> but a lot of people will set up their local dev Docker images so that they automatically refresh the, the files from their local file system. We're not doing that in this particular demo. Um, all of the files are self-contained. Next month, we're going to talk about how you take this approach and then you implement CI/CD or continuous integration and, and continuous deployment um, to monitor a Git repository like GitHub or AWS Git. Uh, and um, as soon as AWS sees changes, it will pull them into through the code pipeline and it will run them through Code Builder. And um, those are warnings on errors. So uh, while I'm talking about this, I'm going to go ahead and um, push that container up to our new registry repo. But anyway, um, like I said, next month, we're going to talk about how to automatically deploy these images. And so some of what you're seeing today um, is, is prep for that. Uh, when we deploy the images, um, we have a, a, a different local workflow, but we work off of containers locally when we're developing. And then when we deploy, we essentially um, deploy uh, uh, testing and it runs through tests and such, and then it will automatically um, kick back an error if there's an issue, or it will automatically deploy to live if everything is green. And so more to come on that next month. Uh, while this is uploading, I'm going to keep moving here. Um, so the step-by-step -step guide, I'll clean this up a little bit, but it talks about um, how you can watch the local Docker logs, um, how you can stop Docker. Um, so we've already 
I guess I, for your benefit, since we already have it running locally, I can show you what that looks like if we, if, uh, it's probably already running. Um, what do we have running? Yes. So port 8080 is the Docker side, and you can see that it's running fine in Docker as well. Um, the health checks, uh, that little uh, host firewall thing is popping up because it's trying to connect to the MySQL on the web. <clears throat> uh, health check passes. Let's go ahead and shut down Docker. We don't need to run that locally anymore. We know that it's working, um, hence why we're going ahead and pushing this. Hmm. All right, so this whole section is talking about running Docker locally. So we're gonna go ahead and move on. We're, we're here at step at this step where we're pushing the images to Amazon. And for those who aren't real familiar with how Docker images work, you'll notice that it's uploading a bunch of different layers. Um, when it imports the OS, that is a layer. When it, when it runs us another command in the Docker file to um, build all the comp uh, PHP, dependencies with Composer, that's yet another layer. And the reason I bring this up is I think that the layering system in Docker is underappreciated by most. Um, if you're able to plan out your Docker file in such a way that the, the things that change the least are closest to the top, um, that allows you to save a lot of time on building and pushing and things like that because this OS uh, file rarely changes. Uh, third party manages that and as updates come then it'll download it and it'll rebuild everything. But let's say the OS file hasn't changed, um, none of these OS uh, updates or packages have changed, um, none of these composer files have changed, and really we're, we're doing our fifth or tenth build for the day and the only things that have changed may be uh, somewhere in here. That means that we're only affecting the last few layers of our Docker file. And so then if we were to make a change and go and do another push, it's almost instant. You're not waiting for it to upload two, three, 400 megabyte again. Uh, sorry for that aside, but like I said, I just think that's an underappreciated um, point that the Docker has put a lot of time into and, and it really does speed up your workflow if you can work with that. Um, all right. And then a uh, note of what to do or look for if you get this no basic auth credentials error when you're following along at work. Um, next, uh, we would build, build out the, we can skip that, I consolidated that. Um, so the cluster, the, a, the load balancer. Um, I think that those have been incorporated into the templates. Uh, it's basically telling you that we needed to manually create some policies um, but at this point, as soon as it's done uploading these layers, we can go and um, start launching services. Um, so I'm going to backtrack just a little bit while it's doing that and look at a couple of these other um, CloudFormation files that we, that we skipped over. I'm going to start with this file that creates the registry and the tasks. Um, I, I'm mostly doing this to emphasize how simple the cloud formation files can be and, and, and that once you get over that hump of understanding how to use them, it's really a huge time saver. Like th this section right here is um, the only piece that's needed to create the repository. It's essentially um, generating a repository name and assigning some permissions. Um, but then it goes on to create uh, a few roles that are required for, for the tasks. Um, this is boilerplate. You'd find this in most Amazon tutorials. Um, and then it goes on to create three tasks. And I'll hop over to, okay, all of those are complete, that's good. I'm gonna pop over to our task definitions just so you can see what those look like. So we have app, cron, and queue. That's the worker that I talked about. And you can see here, app, um, and that, that's where it's defined the app. And in this case, since the app is the web-facing piece, we've also defined port mappings that you won't find in the other sections. Um, and then um, cron 
and Q are different in that since we've built one image that can multitask and do different things, we have to tell it what to do uh, when it boots the cron image. Um, so it's having to run a separate command to do that. By default, it assumes I'm going to run Apache and um, serve web content. So that overrides that process because a Docker container will, by default, only run one process. It's not like a normal Linux environment where you might have dozens or hundreds of processes running. Now, in this particular case, the task that we're running isn't designed to run as a daemon. So we're using supervisor to run it, but it's the only thing running under supervisor. The same thing applies here. Instead of running the cron deal, we're running um, something slightly different. And you'll see that these templates are set up in such a way that they will default to a certain type of command, but you can override it by providing a different command. And so this is the command that you would run for Laravel to monitor a queue called work. Um, sorry, a queue called Q, probably poor name. Um, Docker Q <clears throat> um, to, to monitor for work. And, and in this particular demo, I, um, I'm only d demoing the app in Cron Live. The, I don't have any um, SQS scaffolding built out in this demo, but it's pretty easy to implement. So let's see where we're at with our images. Okay, everything's pushed. Um, let's back up here. Um, that's really all that, um, literally all that this is creating is the registry and the tasks. So let's go on to the next one, the cluster. This one's a little bit more complicated. I'm not gonna lie, this one came from, from an AWS demo. There are very few customizations to it. Um, the only thing that I really did was um, I killed off the security group option and, and hard-coded the security group. And the reason I did that is because these Docker containers um, don't need a lot of outside access. The only ports that are open are port 22, and that's optional, but I, I pr open that so that we can troubleshoot things when needed, for, and that's only allowed from the inside network. And then this dynamic range of ports. This is a Docker thing. Um, these, the, these port numbers are the, the range that Docker will dynamically allocate. So if you spin up a service that's going to listen on a port and you tell um, Docker, or in this case, you tell ECS um, to make that service available on a certain port, um, it does some magical things behind the scenes to, to wire that port to the container and automatically takes care of that. But the gist is you have to have those ports open um, to your local network so that, um, so that it will work. Uh, and then, let's see, what else? That's really the, the highlight here. The rest of this is building out the cluster and defining those EC2 instances. And, um, and I didn't have to, uh, I didn't have to customize much of this. So I, we're, we're using Amazon provided um, ECS images. Um, they're Linux images that are designed to host Docker um, containers and they've been working really well for us. So the, the last piece was the application load balancer, uh, the web face, facing component of all, this whole thing. Um, we build out a, um, we build out the load balancer uh, oh, don't, don't, don't do that. Here, and then um, this is the security group for the load balancer that's essentially allowing the outside world to connect. We're allowing port 80 and port 443 from anywhere to the load balancer. All right, so now let's go and wire a couple of these things together and make this work. Um, as it stands right now, um, from the AWS interface, we have a repository. And when we drill down into the repository, we have our container. And you'll notice this is the same digest that was uploaded here. This SHA 256, 1FDB, 1FDB. Um, so in production, we'll talk about this next month, we tag the images with versions um, that are based on the git hash. Um, but for the 
sake of the demo, um, we're just tagging with latest, and then our tasks are looking for um, the image in this repo with the latest tag. So let's look at one of these task definitions. We're going to drill down into the app task. Um, let's see here. I'm going to zoom out just a little. That's a little much. Um, so when you go to create a task, you're basically specifying the task role, the task name, the task role, the execution role. We've done that through cloud formation. You can also limit the total amount of memory and CPU that the task um, can access. And in this case, we're limiting this um, web-facing app to 384 meg and 128 slices of CPU. And that's out of, uh, that's essentially an eighth of the CPU with the way this is set up. Because by default, they give you 1024 slices. And then we define the container down here. And along with that, we've defined where to, where the image is. And it will automatically download that image from the registry when it boots. And then we've told it, in this case, to listen on the port 80. And then to log our output to um, Amazon's um, CloudWatch. All right. so. <clears throat> Now when we go over to cluster, you'll see we have a cluster, but we don't have any Fargate services running. We don't have any EC2 services running. Let's spin up a couple of services. Um, I don't want to start a cluster. We're going to drill into our cluster, Laravel app, and we're going to create a service. And this is where we wire those task definitions, uh, where we launch those task definitions. So let's start by launching a um, uh, we're going to launch these on EC2. Uh, let's launch a web facing instance. Um, by default, it pulls in the latest revision by default. If you have a bunch of revisions, you could jump around. Um, we're going to call this app and we're going to tell it to launch two of these. And then it's asking us how, how we want them placed across hosts. We only have two hosts, so we're not too worried about that. But if you were, um, Scaling this, you would want to become more familiar with your options there. Um, we're going to uh, rely on an application load balancer to uh, connect the outside world to this container. And we're accepting defaults here, but I am going to configure the connection to the load balancer. I'm going to tell it to listen on port 80. That's HTTP. Um, we're going to um, create a target group called ECS Laravel app. That's fine. And then we're going to tell it our health check path is underscore health. So slash underscore health. Next. Um, I'm not going to worry about auto scaling. Um, all of that looks good. So we're going to create that service. It's going to jump through a couple of things here. Um, as soon as that's done, I'll fire up a cron service as well. And then we'll go back and we'll look at the status of each of those. And you know what? The, the uh, I, I found a bug in the cloud formation template, so you're going to see these disappear. Um, I'm going to have to manually change something in the task definition. I'll fix this before I push it to <coughs> GitHub. Um, I'm going to create. I'm looking at the task definition for app, and it allows me to create a new definition or a new revision through the web interface. And you can see a lot of these settings that we saw in the cloud formation side. Um, but I'm going to drill down to uh, the container definition. And where it shows this image, um, cloud formation's pulling over the um, Amazon ID instead of the URL. So I need to update that path. <clears throat> And then we'll go back to our service, and we're going to force it to use the new image. So in this case, we're looking at the app service. We're updating the app service. And it's going to pull in the current settings. I'm going to tell it, no, I want the latest revision 13, and I'm going to force a new deployment. Um, this is sort of the manual way of managing this infrastructure. So. Um, this is what you would expect if you weren't automatically deploying things. If, if you had a new revision, you would go here to push it. Now if we go to view the service, 
we should see two pinning and here shortly they'll, they'll show running. Um, while we're waiting on that, I'm gonna go and fire up a couple of these crons, but same problem. Um, the cron definition uh, also has the wrong URL for the Docker image, so we're gonna change that real quick. We've created the new revision. We're gonna go back to our cluster that, that actually runs the containers. And we're going to tell it to start up a new service called cron. We're gonna run that on ECS. Run. Um, we'll have it run one task. And then, oh, two, I guess. We have plenty of room here. And in this case, that's not a web-facing um, service. So there's no reason for a load balancer to be involved. And now, while we're waiting for that, um, the task definitions that I've built out are designed for EC2. So I'm going to show you what, what those look like if we were to build one of these out in Fargate. <clears throat> we're just going to hop back and forth here so I can pull in some key info. So we're going to create a task definition by hand. Um, in this case, we're going to create a Fargate task. This will allow us to take advantage of, of their um, on-demand servers instead of relying on our existing EC2 instances, which I guess I should show you that those are running now and um, that's where the magic's happening here. So I'll hop over to EC2 and you'll see a few ECS instances. These, these are the instances that are running the uh, containers and, and Amazon manages that process, but you essentially have control over um, how much uh, you're spending on your resources. So if you have a bunch of EC2 two containers and you're keeping them running non-stop, you could um, qualify for the reserved instances or 60% off um, by committing to running those all the time. Okay, so back to creating a task, uh, let's call this um, uh, cron Fargate. And I'm going to choose the task role uh, and then the tax execution role. These were these roles were already created by um, the uh, CloudFormation script. Uh, then you'll see the drop down where you choose how much memory to assign to the the, the service. And in this case, uh, we're allocating half a gig and a quarter CPU. Whereas in the other case, we're allocating less than that. And then we're going to define our container. Um, Aravel app. There's the image URL that we were just dealing with. Um, since well, this is a cron, we're not going to worry about, um, we don't have to worry about the port mappings, but we do have to make sure that we specify the correct command. Um, wait, what? Sorry, what did I, am I making an app? Yeah, I'm making an app. So we are doing the port. I'm changing my mind. We're calling this cron, <clears throat> even if we called it far, uh, something else. Um, just because I, I don't want it to interfere with the web-facing app that we've already built out. So I'm looking at the existing cron definition, and the, the main thing that I'm having to pull from this is this command. I have to be sure that we carry this exact same command over. And that's not the health check command, it's the environment command. Important distinction. Um, comparing other things here, the environment, we need to set a couple of special environment variables. Um, and so I'll show you how to do that through the web interface. You can add um, one or more keys and values. So we call our script is expecting super command and then the actual command value. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, they make it really easy to log to CloudWatch. So when you do that through the web interface, it just defaults to that. Just double checking my settings here, but that should be it. And you could potentially define multiple containers to run under a service. So if you had several containers that were related and had to be running at the same time, you could define both of them here. 
if you had persistent storage, you would define your volumes here, um, and then that would help manage that. I don't have a lot of experience with that since we don't rely on this environment for any pers data persistence. Um, so I can't tell you how well that does or does not work. I'd assume that it works fine, but I just haven't used it. So now let's try to boot up this cron on Fargate. So we're gonna say, let's create a service based on this. Tell it to run on Fargate. Uh, which version of the Fargate platform will use the latest? What do we want to call the service name? Cron Fargate. Uh, just to um, distinguish between that and the other cron. And we'll run two tasks here as well. And now when we go to look at the logs, we should be able to see plenty of cron activity. Um, it's asking us what VPC we want to run that on. We only have one VPC in our account, but or one virtual network. Um, and then which subnets it's allowed to run on. I'll just choose the first few because we're not really picky for this. Um, this is a low IO application. And then finally, a load balancing and such, uh, again, doesn't apply for a cron application. Uh, service discovery, they have some pretty neat features here. Uh, we, we don't use those, but I, I so I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about them. Um, I'm gonna shut them off right now. But if you're building out your own microservices, you would find that pretty handy. Um, let's go ahead and create that. Now let's go back and see what our cluster is looking like. Um, so when we drill down to our cluster, we have three running services. We have our web app, and it's running two tasks, and we have uh, two different cron apps, and neither of them are working. So I probably somehow um, missed something in that task. Maybe I didn't plug in the URL correctly. Let's drill down to the app. Um, you can see what, when you drill down to the tasks, um, you can see a little bit more information. If you drill down to the actual task, you can even see which EC2 instance it's running on. You can see some logging. In this case, we're seeing the health checks from AWS for this particular task. Um, if we jump over to the other I don't know which one I just clicked on. It'll be, it'll look just the same. But if we look at logging there, you're going to see the same thing. Now, if we go to, <clears throat> let's browse to this website. Um, we need to find out what the URL is of our load balancer. So we go to EC2. So I jump to that tab and then we go down to our load balancer. And it shows a DNS name for the load balancer. We're just gonna browse to that. We haven't done anything with SSL today. I'm keeping it simple. The load balancer uh, supports enabling SSL. That's a, a no cost upgrade. Um, but you, now you can see the site out on AWS. I'm gonna go switch over to the logs so we can see if, which one we hit. So you can see that we hit um, task E8AC, I'm gonna jump over um, to the other task, and then I'm gonna wrap up here. Um, E8, all right, here's the other one. So when you look at these logs, um, the interesting piece here is that my Mac pulled this, the home page from, from this server, but it pulled the fav icon from this server. So you can already tell that it's, it's hitting both of them. If I refresh a few times um, and go back and re refresh over here, you can see um, that it probably is preferring a server over the other. And, and yeah, it's uh, actually round robbing across both of them. So there you go. Um, I was hoping on the cron side to show you what these logs look like when they hit CloudWatch. Um, CloudWatch. We'll see what made it over here, but I want you to know where to look. You would go to CloudWatch and Logs, and you'll have streams for your various um, instances. So in this case, App, um, we can look at uh, this stream, and we can see all of our raw uh, Apache output. Um, and, and so this is sort of the way that you manage logs in this kind of application. You don't store your logs on the local instance. Uh, going back to not storing persistent data, log data included. There's nothing of importance on those containers. So literally we can lose one at any moment and be just fine about it. Um, let's look at these cron logs. 
Um, so it's complaining that uh, the supervisor script isn't set up quite right. So I'll have to check into that before I publish this, the code. But it, Fargate is running this, and it is reporting activity to the log, which is helpful for troubleshooting. Um, most of the time, you can get the info that you need um, at this level. You'll notice that there isn't just a normal cron. So Fargate's doing a good job of reporting everything, but our EC2 instance is not. And we would have to drill down into um, ECS to figure out what's going on there. So that is another advantage of Fargate. It's a little bit more transparent, but that's because they know that you can't SSH into it to troubleshoot anything. Um, in this particular case, we could go to, um, well, I'll spare you the details, I'll just fix it. But the gist of it is there is a, uh, there are a couple different places you can drill down into to see more detail here. So that's firing up Laravel on ECS in less than an hour. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to dig into uh, the, the same uh, the technical side of Django on ECS, but I am going to publish all that information. So you'll have the same type of information where you can um, essentially um, you'll have a, a, there's a folder for Laravel and a folder for Django and you can build out either environment and and honestly in um, in the Laravel demo that I have open here um, I would recommend for production use combining these three cloud formation scripts um, so that all of your ECS um, pieces are built out together um, maybe keep the load balancer separate but certainly the the cluster and the tasks and the registry can be combined. Uh, but the, I would recommend keeping the MySQL server separate just so that if you decide to completely change out your cloud formation environment for ECS, you're not having to figure out how to maintain your um, database server. I mean, it can be done, but uh, usually I try to, when I'm doing these things, I try to segment them by major service. Jason, is that how you guys do things? Or do you, in this case, would you recommend combining everything? You do break it up? Okay, so the same type of application. I, sometimes I feel like I'm operating in a silo, and so it's always good to make sure that I'm not doing something crazy. But, but that's, that's what we're gonna cover for today. Um, and with that, uh, I'm gonna just check through the pricing, of the slides. Um, we, we hit those, um, we hit some of that. And we didn't really get into metrics. Um, you, you can find, um, ECS metrics in the, the cluster settings and in um, CloudWatch in the metrics area where you build out graphs and such. Uh, you can make nice dashboards with all of the, the metrics. Um, <clears throat> by default, EC2 is going to show you CPU and network and such. When you, when you set up an ECS cluster, you can also monitor memory and um, just overall utilization versus re reservations, which is handy. You can also monitor CPU and memory usage on a per service basis. Um, we did all of those things. Does anyone have any questions? I know it's one, and I don't want to hold you guys all, all too long, but I will stick around afterwards if there are any one-off questions that you don't think would benefit the group. Otherwise, um, thank you very much for coming out. Um, next month, we're going to talk about um, how you would automatically deploy these things to ECS with um, uh, code pipeline and code build, uh, the, the different um, CI CD tools on AWS. So uh, hopefully you guys can make it out. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to stick around or hit us up in the Slack channel. Again, that's Springfield Web Developers Slack, and we're in uh, hashtag AWS. Um, also follow us on Meetup and Facebook. And um, with that, we'll see you next month. All right. Ooh.